Um, thank you, Rob, for a brilliant introduction about why change and innovation, and I'm going to use that word a few times during this session, why innovation is necessary. Um, Gary, as we've heard, is going to talk a little bit about what. So we've got a why, we've got there's going to be a good chunk of what can be done in order to um, get better, in order to meet the need, if you like, of the, of the overall customer. But what I'm going to do, and what Adele's going to do, and what Mike's going to do, is variants on answering the question, how the hell are we going to free up capacity to think about, develop, and deliver the what? Okay? So, I'll be as swift as I can through some of these slides, but then I want to sort of dwell on one or two, and I'd like some audience participation as well. Don't worry, you're not going to have to dance or anything, there'll be nothing, nothing too silly. Quick um, show of this slide. I put this slide up originally in Borneo, if anybody was there two years ago at the Sigma conference, and I don't think there's a massive amount of change. I don't even want to go through any of the detail of that. Other than to say that at that time, and this is as, as much about my personality as it is about the slide, is I think you are awash with opportunities. Don't beat me up. I genuinely do think you are awash with opportunities. And one of those opportunities that actually the heat is on. We were talking last night at dinner about the fact that unfortunately, even when there's a fantastic vision in front of you about what community pharmacy could be, dream, 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 then we tend not to move. It's not just pharmacy, it's any industry. Certainly my experience is being a change manager and a transformation leader, if you like, in organizations, is that as well as a vision, you really do need some heat up the backside. And it does motivate, you know, where there's a need, that's where innovation really comes from. You're there to sort of think about things to make that need, well, to satisfy that need, whatever it is, okay? So I think it's cup half full time, and I know some people have argued with me as well about this sort of thing, but there are lots of opportunities. And going back to the original question about the how bit, I think there's a lot of opportunities for community pharmacy about how you free up capacity so that you can do and think about and develop more and more new things. And I've seen some fantastic examples, and gosh, back in 2014 when I was working with Robert Pharmacy Voice, um, Rob was telling me about some things that made me, you know, delighted. You know, the, some of the services that in very, very small pockets in this country are already being offered just blew me away. Okay, so to not just survive, but thrive, I know it's a bit of a cliche these days, we must innovate. Let me ask you a question. What is innovation? What are the ingredients? What do you think? Just There's no right and wrong answers. Just bounce out a couple of words, please. And if you don't participate, I'll cry. You'd be very embarrassed. I want to see him cry. A new ways of doing something. New ways of doing something. Okay, what else? There's no right and wrong. Different ways. Different ways. New ways, different ways of doing something. What else? What are the ingredients? What makes innovation successful? Ideas. 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 Saving time. Pressure. Pressure. So a bit of pressure maybe might be driving that motivation forward as well. We talked about that need. But anything else? Knowing, knowing the end point. Yeah. And you know where you start, you know where you end, but it's the middle bit which you can you can muddle your way through it in a way, I think. Yeah. It's just not worrying about it and not think there's a challenge or a problem. Yeah. And this is the sort of how bit again yeah. in, in a bit more detail. Anything else? Disruptors. Disruptors. Just a few words. Like I say, no right, no wrong. These are all really helpful, thankfully, for my next slide. <laughs> um, innovation. You mentioned about ideas. We can have a lot of ideas. Is an idea on its own an innovation? This is the bit where you participate again. There's a little right. bit of a shame. Thank you. Jolly good. And you've already said this in any case, but the next bit is about it has to have an impact. So to your point, Danny, it must disrupt. Disrupt what? It's disrupting something about that need. It is satisfying a need. It is having an impact on the need that's been found or seen in the environment that we're working in and we have to innovate. But Mike, to your point about you know filling in the bit in between where we are now to where we want to be, the implementation is just as important. You can have a fantastic idea with a fantastic potential impact, but if implemented badly, and there have been a couple of examples where the implementation, for example, has been variable, MUR, blah, blah. 
then it's not necessarily going to lead to that fantastic innovation that's coming out at the end or its, its reputation of being an innovation. And if you implement something badly, even if it is the best idea and has a fantastic impact, you seldom get a second chance, do you? So when something's piloted, oh, it was rubbish, it was a crap idea. Rubbish, didn't work. It might just be that it was the implementation that was poor. So we need to really think about how do we pilot these things well and how are they planned. Anyway, my passion lies around this stuff, as you can tell. And without those three ingredients, we haven't got innovation. Coming back to the question, how do we find time for more services? And I'm just going to focus on one aspect of answering that question about how. Um, and I just want to refer to uh, a couple of things. One, innovation doesn't have to come from you as, as, as a leader. You're not the one that has to come up with the clever rocket a week ideas. And by the way, is innovation always a rocket a week? It can be something really tiny, it could be something really cheap, it could be just a behavioural shift or whatever it is, but it might have a massive impact. I'm going to give a few examples of what we've seen in pharmacy where there can be really big impacts without any money involved. A couple of quick stories. I got asked once back in way, way back in the chemical industry when I was managing a plant that I thought I managed really well. I got asked to improve performance by 10%, bearing in mind it was already at great capacity. And the health and safety head in me said, it's naughty to do anything more through this plant because I will blow it up. And I could have blown it up. And I spent 24 hours, and I can't really describe this in any other way, other than to say that I was crapping myself, thinking, I do not know how to do this. They wanted 10% extra throughput, and they wanted me to reduce the downtime on this already, in my view, well-run plant, by 10%. So I had my need. I had my source for innovation, and I didn't have any ideas. So I spent 24 hours thinking, what the hell can I do about it? And what I did was I got everybody and anybody who had had anything to do with that plant in the room, and I tricked them with cake and all sorts of things to keep them there, and to come up with ideas, please. These are the two goals. Can you help me? And to sort of throw in another layer on this, these were PhD engineers, PhD chemists, these were plant operators. Quiet Mick was the plant operator that comes to my mind. And he came up with the killer idea. I had 300 ideas by the end of the day. I then had to trick them with more cake and possibly some alcohol, I think, was involved to get them to prioritize against the need. So will these have an impact? And we came up with 16 ideas. Quiet Mick's idea still was the best idea. I've been given £200,000 to do this job, and I could give it all back because Mick's idea, well, most of it back, Mick's idea was six grand, and it gave us £2.8 million worth of profit every year thereafter. And he did get rewarded, but my point about this is that I didn't come up with a single idea, but there are a lot of people in your organisations who, believe me, are gagging to make things different, and we see that when we do our studies, and I'll talk a little bit about that it's often the quietest or the smallest or the lowest, for want of a better description, in the organization whose hands are on the problem, who know how to solve it, yeah? I hope that that's reasonably <laughs> straightforward. Um, but it's, it's hard still to harness and, and harvest, if you like, those ideas, and then when you've got 300 ideas, trying to prioritize them, it's a really hard process. Any questions or thoughts at this point? This making sense? Do you relate this to your world in pharmacy and in your pharmacies? Some nods. So what we've done is we've turned our process of making things more product productive on ourselves. And coming back into pharmacy, my last story is about 2014, 2014, yeah, I got asked by Lloyd's Pharmacy, hello again Danny, to have a look at the uh, dispensary to see if I could get more out but without having to put more resources in and I said yes of course I can because that's what my background is and I have a range of superpowers and all that nonsense and actually I really struggled when I went in two reasons one I've never seen anything move as fast and I know this might be a worn out analogy for one or two of you but it's like watching an octopus juggling spaghetti that's first of all been cut into bits watching people in the dispensary it's very very multitasking fast moving stuff. So you try and do a detailed study the way that we do it, and, and it's really, really difficult. But we did it manually, and what we do is we collect data. If you imagine that there's a big 
glass sphere in front of me right now. That big glass sphere is the dispensary and the pharmacist is in there and the team's in there and there's all sorts of stuff going on. That is the operating system, if you like. We go in and do a study, but we stand right on the edge of the sphere and we look at everything that's going on in there in massive detail. So we go second by second, what's happening with the processes and the people in there. And it doesn't take us very long, it takes us about three days to do a full dispensary study. But we are second by second. It was really hard to do the transcription bit and the analysis bit without the use of software and, and our analytical um, tool that we've developed. I did 15 days of study, it took me 20 days to analyse it and do the transcription, which wasn't adding any value to the client at all, but they had to pay for it at the time, because nobody else could do anything other than manual. And then we've got the time to interpret it and do some recommendations and hopefully add a bit of magic to it when we present it back. What we've done is we've produced a tool that helps us eradicate the transcription and analysis bit, because we gather data straight onto an app and then it gets converted into the report immediately so that we can engage with the, the guys in the team. So what do we look at? We look at all the activities that are going on, not just the ones that you think are going on or that might be in your standard operating procedure. We look at the core activity. Now from a process point of view, this is the stuff that's adding value. It's converting that script or whatever it is you're doing into a final patient ready output at the end of it. It may be a service, it may be a process, prescribing, whatever. It adds value. We've got a bunch of enabling activities that allow value to be added, but in themselves they don't add value. And so we want to either delegate them away, if it's a pharmacist, or we want to reduce them and make them more efficient. And the inhibiting stuff is basically stuff that you end up doing that you shouldn't be doing at all. So it might be rework, it could be you're dealing with an IT outage or whatever but there's something that you shouldn't be doing at all. And these things here are taking time away from you being the best you can be as a pharmacist and a pharmacy team to deliver only value to the customer, whether that's the NHS, the patient, whatever. Is that all okay? Any questions at that point? Do, 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 this is, you're happy with this, yeah? Mm -hmm. See you not. And we have a number of applications that we do studies for. The main ones are, we will look at, in detail, what a pharmacist is doing now to determine what can they delegate safely. If, and the second one is, the dispensary team have capacity to take that delegation safely. So we don't want to make people work harder. This is definitely about, let's keep smart, let's make sure that people are not working any harder at all. And what we found is that there is a lot of capacity. I'll show you a couple of slides in a minute with the results. How am I doing the time, by the way? About halfway through? Okay. So we have um, we found capacity in the dispensary so that the pharmacist can safely delegate the non-core activities, which of course frees them up to do some thinking about what are the services going to be, how do we implement them, and indeed then start delivering them as business as usual. Yeah? So that's kind of what we do. There's all sorts of other applications for the, for the tool, but they're the main ones uh, in this context. I won't go through this slide, but I just wanted to show you this little dotted line here. We are not just about going in and doing a study. We engage lightly, but with real impact, with the people in the team so that by the end of our study, they own the recommendations that we're making. So underneath the studies that we do, we've run an anonymous idea gathering, uh, process as a tool that we use for that and that allows us to harvest their ideas like I did in the in the chemical industry but a, a lot more efficiently so that when we come up with our recommendations and we can see the similarities between those two uh, harvested sets of ideas we can shake hands if you like with the, the people in the team and they take greater ownership of it because it actually is their idea what we've done is we've amplified it and quantified it and said this is what you could save if you do this but we then take them through a simulation exercise and also make sure that they really understand what the art of the possible is. And again, if anybody wants to know detail about that, I can share that with you. A few quick things then. We've calculated that there's over 10 million hours of available capacity for pharmacists to alleviate pressure. I can go through that calculation with you, but either way you look at it, and I know the numbers have changed a bit on the number of pharmacies, 
whether it's 60,000 pharmacists and I take a quarter of that at 50 hours a, a, per person per month, it's still in the tune of eight to 10 million. And we've halved what we've observed. And by the way, we haven't included accuracy checking in what we've said is delegable, which we know is delegable to ACTs. So there's a lot of time available, and we've proven that the dispensary can take that delegated time comfortably with a bit of extra time as well for items growth. So a few examples. When we did, this is over, there's about 200 samples here of a, an end-to-end -end, uh, walk-in acute script. Um, we found that the, uh, there was 44% of the, the time was just spent sat there. Now that's okay, but continuing like that, people walk out. If people walk out, you're adding automatically steps to your process. I know these seem like small things, but they really do add up if you've got thousands of scripts over the year. And that unnecessary processing is, you know, because we've got to put it on a shelf somewhere, put the script somewhere that we can find it. When they come back in, we've got to find the script and we've got to find the bag. So you're adding four steps to a process by allowing them to leave. But removing that red time means that you can keep them in. They can actually look around your merchandise if you've got a front of the store. And um, it facilitates and you are or any other service completion whilst they're waiting. So you know the pharmacist, if they've got time, can engage right the way through what should have been a, a waiting time. Actually, it's not waiting anymore. They're being served or serviced in some way, such then when the bag comes around, it's a sort of bonus that they've got the thing at the end of another conversation. Okay, another example of pharmacist delegation. This is where we put a few changes in, very simple changes to layout and a few behavioral changes and a couple of policy changes. And that was the difference between pharmacists before and pharmacists after. We actually reduced the amount of blue by 31%. They filled some of that with the green core time and they had time to spare. Uncomfortable for that particular individual because they want to be busy. The habit is we're used to being busy. We don't want to be busy, we want them to be as free as they can be to do stuff that's not non-core. Yeah? Especially if the team's got the capacity to do it all. So don't worry about being the laziest person in the, in the room, because it's not about being lazy, it's about taking opportunities to develop new stuff. This was the um, detail on the 50 hours. I'll go through that later with anybody else. A few little findings extra before I finish. These are from a number of studies, whether it's with the NPA, we did a trial with the NPA with a number of people, or from some of our clients where we've seen interesting findings. So, collection process, argue one way or the other, um, but our evidence very strongly tells us that stowing prescriptions alphabetically, if you're on the front foot with making them and, and, and getting them ready, is way more efficient than the matrix type of system. Yeah, you've got to do some interesting different things, but 21 hours on average is what we're finding there. Repeat dispensing process, again, same thing. Stowing it alphabetically saves time during the dispensing process itself. Six hours a month we were finding. I don't need to go through all of these, but uh, you know, looking at dispensary layout, just the amount of movement. Movement equals waste. We did a brilliant, uh, or saw a brilliant example of a fantastic pharmacy in Buckinghamshire. Unfortunately, Julie, uh, has sold her business now, and she's on the other side working with the CCGs, bringing pharmacy into the mix, if you like, Julie Horsman, anyone knows her. And she brought us in to really validate that they were already pretty good. Um, we found 30 hours for her uh, per month in terms of extra pharmacist time, and they were fantastic. But they made a few very small changes to their layout, and that resulted in a significant amount of time saved just because she didn't have to keep moving to do the bits of the process that she was having to do. And then, when the capacity came from other things, she could delegate those things anyway to the ACT. So, interesting things that you can find through this, but in summary, it's about looking in detail, real detail, second by second, finding the little gems that are making you work in a certain way, do <coughs> away with the fundamental cause or just change the way it's working, and you can make a vast difference in terms of how the organisation performs and free up time for the, for the pharmacist. This is a precursor as well for things like studying um, for the purpose of what will the robot need to be, for example, if you are looking at a robot. So what we're looking at there is what would the design of it be in a holistic sense so that you're 
getting the best out of a robot and it's not wagging you, you're wagging it, if you like. I'm not going to take my extended here, he's going to talk about this.